Hi, Moto America fans. Welcome to this latest edition of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. I am obviously Bice, especially in video. It's pretty easy to tell. And Carruthers is over uh, to the other side there. And uh, we're excited to do a live video here. And we have Roger Hayden in the middle. Uh, I, I almost wanted to call you an elder statesman of our sport, but that's a little rough. So I'll just say it's about, you know, about time we had Roger on. He's a great person to talk to. He's currently involved in our color commentary on our broadcasts and stays very involved in the sport still. Um, so it's, it's great to have him, but let's, let's start with Paul. Paul, we're in, we're in uh, Michelin Racelet Way Road, Atlanta, and their brand new media center. It's beautiful. Yeah. This building's really impressive. It's like, it's like night and day of what they used to have. I remember when we first came here in 2015 and it was basically that little shed that's been here <laughs> since the beginning of time and it was pouring rain. And I remember pushing with a push broom, pushing the mud back out the back <laughs> door and I couldn't do it as fast as it was coming in. And then now look at it. So yeah, it's come a long way and obviously, uh, yeah, they're, they're putting some money into the facility and, and I already, I really like the facility and the town and the, the racetrack. And I think the riders always like it. So it's always a cool place to come, but it just got a lot better. Yeah, I mean, Roger, this is kind of a home track for you, wouldn't you say? Yeah, for me it was for sure, because uh, like growing up every year, the, the weird GNF was here. And that was like the, at the end of the year, the, the grand you know, final. So I grew up coming here a lot. And then also throughout the year, they would have races here. So I've been coming here for so long. I was here when I had the gravity cavity. Oh, yeah. So that was... Uh, a long, long time ago. Yeah, I mean, you guys came here when you were little, little kids on little 125s yeah. and stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, real young, 11, 12 years old. So been coming there for a while. It's not too far from home, uh, six hours. And I remember one year with me, Tommy, and uh, Nikki was both racing here. We had, uh, you know, we got like 200 tickets for people from our hometown, and they all, you know, came, and they named that hill over there and turned 10. It was Hayden Hill. Because it was just all people from Owensboro. So, mm. so if you had 200 tickets, you had to have gotten 10 people from another town then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that I was actually, I went to Owensboro for Nikki's deal and I was like blown away. Because, you know, you just, you, you hear all the talk and you think it's just some podunk little town. It's a bigger town, town it, yeah. It, it's a nice little city. And yeah. I mean, it's, I guess they revamped it, you know, because I hadn't yeah. seen it before, but it's really nice down there now. Yeah, it's definitely, not, they spent a lot of money on the, the downtown part but i'd say some people probably made some tickets too and probably copied them probably sold them at the front <laughs> gate too. Know. <laughs> you know talking about your town though a little bit roger before we get into racing and stuff i wanted to ask you about this news about the um nikki hayden memorial the apartments there can you tell us about that we saw some photos on social media of that whole thing tell us how that works yeah they had we have uh you know my family especially my my parents and my dad they uh they do a lot of stuff in the community and it kind of helps them, uh, you know, it's kind of therapeutic for them. And they decided to, you know, they have this other place where they, that works with like kids. And now they did the one with the, the homeless shelter in Owensboro, but they built these apartments, these uh, for a single parent. And, um, you know, it's to help you transition from homelessness to the independence and get your life back on track. And uh, they're just, just freshly got built. We just seen them last week. They're really nice. And, you know, it's just to give back. And, you know, a family likes to, you know, want to keep Nikki's legacy going. And so we do a lot of stuff with this foundation. And that's one of the things that we do with these apartments. And it's a really cool thing. And it kind of puts, it helps you put your own life in perspective whenever, you know, you think about, Sometimes you think how rough you have it, you don't have to travel here, have to travel there. And then you, you see families that are like, you know, some kids been wearing the same shoes for two years. And, you know, and it's just like, it really helps you put things in perspective. And, you know, they're going to put in a playground before long for kids. And, you know, there's going to be classes and all that. So it's just, it's not just a shelter for them to come set, stay. It's just a hopefully temporary come there get your life back in order, get a job, get everything, and then move on to, to your own place. Mm, mm, that's cool. Yeah, it is really, really nice. You know, speaking of, of Nikki, I mean, as we do this podcast today, it's today's Nikki's birthday, 39th birthday. Uh, Raj, I mean, let's talk about it as a celebration and and tell me, tell Paul and I and the, and the fans, do you have any interesting stories about any certain birthday that, that Nikki had, anything about a cake or a present he got? Do you have one? I'm sure you've got a story. Yeah, well, I mean, I got a 
couple stories, but I don't know if they're... Uh, you can tell anything on here. I don't know if they're, they're for the camera, but I remember a couple times we've had a couple uh, couple pretty big parties for his birthday, but, uh, you know, nothing really nothing really too exciting to that that stands out that's just a a great story but it's uh you know it's it's kind of hard not to be sad but at the same time you know it, it is a reminder but at the same time you know like he doesn't want us to be you know down or sad so it's like a day of celebration but we had some pretty cool parties i just remember one time we had this blowout uh pool party and we told we asked my parents we were gonna have like 10 people come over and you know how it is when you're a little bit younger you know you tell 10 friends 10 friends tell 10 friends yeah. and then it's just like <laughs> next thing you know there's 60 people at my, my parents house so uh that was that was pretty fun <laughs> and i'm sure well okay the one one friend i assume you still hang out with him is your friend reynolds was yeah. he there he was at the oh party. yeah he was there but he uh he wasn't in the pool though he i don't know he didn't uh he never got in the water, but he, he was definitely there. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, well, let's talk about, I mean, you probably are as busy now as you were even when you're racing, if not more busy. I mean, I know you're doing stuff with the Champ School. You're doing this commentary for us. Tell us what you've been up to lately. Let, let the fans in on stuff. Um, really, I mean, I wasn't, during the, the pandemic and stuff, I really wasn't uh, that busy. It's just like, it just seems like there's nothing to do. Then all of a sudden there's a bunch of stuff within like two weeks. So, uh I'm really excited to be doing the commentating stuff with Moto America, you know, the live plus it's something new and something I have to learn. And it's not as easy as I thought it was going to be, you know, cause there's a couple, sometimes during a session, like at road America when it's raining and, and nobody's out there, but we still have to, <laughs> we still have to feel that, you know, that 30 minutes. And so it's, some of it's kind of hard, but it's also like getting used to somebody speaking in my ear whenever I'm, I'm talking. Oh, so I don't know uh, how you do that. That's so hard, but really the, the beginning of it, I was, wasn't that talkative because I was always so afraid of like screwing up, but it's just like racing. You know what I mean? Like you can't be afraid to fail. You know, the more seat time I get, you know, the more comfortable I feel. And now I really feel like I'm uh, getting in my groove and, you know, I'm starting to do some schools with the, the champ school. And, you know, it's so much fun for me because not only I get to give back and help people, you know, learn about the sport that I love and ride safer and ride faster, but, I get to go ride all kinds of different bikes. You know, whenever I was riding for Kawasaki, all I ever got to ride, you know, was a Kawasaki. Then I've been riding Suzuki since 2011. And that's the only thing I've rode since 2011 was a Suzuki 1000. So now I've got to ride an R1, a Ducati. I rode the Yamaha 400 one time. I rode an R6 and yeah, that's just, cool. just go and ride and not worrying about a lap time. Like, you know, this past week, uh, I figured I'd had to turn all the electronics off. So there was like no wheelie control, no traction control. And I was just like leaving these fat black lines all the way around the the whole track. And it was just, and, you know, it's just been cool to go and, and ride for fun again. Yeah, that's good. Do you, do you miss the racing part a lot? There's, there's parts that I miss for sure. You know, I miss the, the good days. I miss the, you know, the feeling of winning, but you know, there's a lot of other stuff that, you know, I I don't miss to like it. Um, VIR when I gave you a ride back after your crash. Yeah, and, I don't. Your, I don't miss your, uh, that part of your body between your two legs yeah. was kind of smashed. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, don't think totally that, that was some crash. <laughs> I don't miss the uh, the crashes. That's one thing that uh, I don't miss. But uh, you know, there's a lot. I think there's always you know when an athlete retires, there's always going to be things that you that you miss, but. You always have to look back at the reason why you, you know, you got to look back at the reason why you retire. But sometimes though, you know, I go to these schools and, you know, I start to get in a pretty good rhythm or, and riding pretty good. And people start staying, saying stuff and it's like, <laughs> uh, well, you know what, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe. Oh, still, people are encouraging yeah, you to keep yeah, racing. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, then I have to bring myself back to reality. Well, the thing <laughs> I remember is you were, as definitive as any rider I've ever seen about, okay, I'm not going to be racing, but I think you were dealing with some injuries at the time. You had maybe a year or some time off and you started getting healthy again. You did some flat track. I think you got probably as healthy as you'd been in a long time. And maybe you thought, Hey, I can still kind of do this somewhat. Is that, is that that's, fair? That's really fair to say because, uh, my last year riding, I was, uh, I was having to get my, I was having a lot of problems with my shoulder and, uh, 
if I was going to race again the next year, I was going to get it fixed. So uh, I went and got it injected a couple times the last my last year, but but then, like I said, I stopped racing and I stopped doing all that stuff, and I didn't do anything for for so long. And then when I started back riding again, it was like I had no shoulder pain, mm -hmm. all this other pain had done gone away, and it was like, you know, like maybe that's that's what I needed. But you can't take that time off if you know you're gonna race the following year you know i can't just tell suzuki or another manufacturer hey, i'm not going to train till you know the season starts so now that i feel good and the flat tracking was uh it was like a cool transition from you know full on to full to on to doing a couple races and it didn't matter how i did and uh and then doing this you know moto america stuff is actually a lot of fun because i do enjoy being at the races it's you know it's like even though I'm not riding, I still love being here and being around the people. And I mean, I, I grew up in this paddock, basically. It's funny because, you know, we know that you've always been appreciative of your fans. And we see the comments that you see regarding people will post something that's got you on it. And they're like, hey, we love Raj on the commentary. We get it in the inbox all the time. You know, we hope you'll continue to do it. I've talked to you about it a couple of times. And it's got to be great for you to hear that and encourage you to want it you need to do it more and it's probably helping you to even have more fun with it right because they like what they hear yeah definitely you know it's always encouraging to hear you know like uh you know when people like your stuff or they like you or they you know they bring up a couple of things that you said that you know they're oh we never thought of it like that and uh so it's it's just helping other people kind of get the feeling what it's like as the rider like while they're doing certain things and stuff that you wouldn't think about and uh it's been cool to have the fan support and it's it's actually doing me they're actually doing me a pretty good job because you know now it's kind of in you know the, the comments the inboxes and you know people see that so now every chance that i get to fill in you know chuck gives me a call and uh so hopefully you know maybe it can be full time and you know right now i'm just a substitute it makes it way harder to fire him when he's when you yeah that's home. right if the That's fans right. revolt against it, you know, it's pretty tough. You know, I wanted to ask you a little about, about your writing. Just, we used to hear, and I, I would hear or read this about, you know, Nicky, one of the one of the secrets to his success, other than his incredible work ethic, work ethic and talent, which you have as well, is the fact that Tommy was the older brother, so he would chase Tommy around. And, you know, he had he had somebody in front of him. As the younger, uh, younger youngest brother of the three, did you have that same thing? Did you did you chase Nikki around? You chase chase Tommy around? I mean, was it was having those two bigger brothers? What what did that do for you? No, it was huge because yeah. you know I was always chasing somebody that was better than me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like any other sport. If you go play basketball with somebody that you know you beat really bad every single time, you're not going to get better. You know, you go play basketball with some dude and you get you get beat a couple times or or any sport, golf, it doesn't matter. So. Uh, that was a huge help for me because, uh, for one, it, it helped me get my foot in the door earlier. But, you know, I had two brothers that I could go ask for for advice, and I get to, you know, I got to ride with. I got to see how they approached racing, and and yeah, it was a huge help because you know not only was I chasing Nikki, but then I was chasing Tommy as well, and you know, so it definitely uh, always gave me a target to to chase, but also. Being the youngest brother came with a lot of expectations, and in the beginning, it was pretty. Hard. It was hard to to live up to those, and uh, you know, I wasn't early, but finally, when I did, it was kind of uh, it was kind of refreshing. And then, you know, you always, as the younger brother, you always want to get the respect of your your older brother. And you know, like the first time I, I beat Tommy Warren at Barber, it was like, you know, one of the best feelings. Not because, you know. Well, for one, it was my first professional race. But it was like, dude, I, you know, I'm 21, and now I've been trying to beat this guy for, you know, 10 years, and I finally did it at a, you know, huge race, you know. So, uh, and then when, you know, the last couple of years when I was riding here in, in the the U.S., you know, Nikki was telling my dad one time just like how good I was riding. Oh, that's cool! And it was just wow. like, you know, you always want your brother's approval, sure. especially when you look up to him. Yeah. So. That's pretty good because a lot of times, you know, you guys had such fun together. That there's probably a lot of teasing going ar around. It's nice to get some legitimate like praise once in a while. It's not yeah. like filled with joking or We're, something. We're like super competitive, like basketball or anything else. Like we'll argue, 
you know, chasing lap times in my parents' field or me and, when Tommy and Nikki went for the championship or me and Tommy went for the 600 championship or race, we could always leave it at the track. You know, like we didn't bring it home and separate the family. You know what I mean? Like, wasn't like, oh, I don't want to go to dinner. Tommy's going to be there and I have to, you know, I have to <laughs> beat him next week or, and then Tommy, Nikki had the same thing before, before that. And you could always, we could always, you know, there was tight passes that, you know, I put on Tommy that he didn't like and, and vice versa. But I knew at the end of the day, you have to separate that, you know, it's a, not only is it a job, but, you know, it's just part of it. And, so I guess the best thing for us was we could separate it. Not only was it good for the for the racing part, but it was like even bicycling and training. Like once you could close the gap and like, you know, then you could hang with them and then you can work with them. It was just like always gave you something to to chase. And I think that was like why there were so many people in Orangeboro that's been successful, you know, like J.D. Beach and a couple other guys because we always had good guys to train with that if you showed up and you didn't, you weren't into it or you wanted to just ride around that day, you was going to, you know, you was going to get beat pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> when you look back at all the years, you did it for a long time, obviously, like there's a super sport championship year, et cetera, et cetera. Is there, is there one year that stands out to you as like the most fun or the most gratifying or I mean, was was like winning, like you know, late here in Moto America, you won you won some superbike races. Was, was that more gratifying than the super sport title, or is that not the case? I think the the super sport title was was so gratifying because I was chasing it so long. When, you know, one year I had a bike break, you know, and I lost the championship by like ten points, and you know, I was in third place when the bike broke with one lap to go. So it kind of it kind of hurt the my title chances and then then the well the first year I got second the next year that happened the next year I won the first two races and I broke my leg and then I had to set out so I was like you know I was ready to mark that off my list it just to, took longer than you thought and it just kept taking so long and finally when I got it done it was just like the biggest relief because my two brothers you know won that championship too so I thought how cool it was that you know all three of us won the super sport title and so that year was probably ranked pretty high up there. It was 07. I did the, you know, that that year I did the MotoGP race at Laguna. So it was kind of cool that weekend to win the Super Sport race and get a top 10 in MotoGP. Yeah, not many people have done that. Yeah, not no. many people have done that. So that's a, that's a pretty pretty good day. And then 2017 was a, you know, here was a pretty satisfying season as well just because you know, I kind of put it all together finally and, you know, was up for, I think every race I finished, you know, I was on the podium. Your mar the, the, the margins that you got beat by. In yeah. So yeah. many races. Like when I look at just the Moto America Superbike races, there's so many that are just like yeah. a fraction of a second yeah, between cool. winning and not. And thanks. Thanks for reminding yeah, me. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> little buzz kill. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, there's one race that was before Moto America that I remember. It was, I don't know if it was 13. You, you'll know. It, Homestead. Yeah. Uh, talk about that. Because was I don't remember. Was that was that raining that day? No, it wasn't. Okay. It was actually. It was uh, the next day, right? The next day it rained. But uh, the day before it kind of, uh, it rained. But that race was was dry. And it was my first Superbike win. And that was definitely satisfying because. You know, I let it from start to finish yep. and to always win your first Superbike race and to do it for, for Michael Jordan was really cool. And I was just telling somebody this story the other day that um, somebody from the team texted me and said, you know, Michael's going to call you later and tell you good job. And uh, I was all right. So I started thinking to myself, all right, when he calls, if he calls, I'm not going to keep him on the phone too long because I don't want to be one of those people, you know, and then like he'll never call me. So as soon as he calls and okay, I answer, <laughs> yeah, I can't, I just think, get him off the phone. I was like, all right, man, thanks. Well, I got to go. I got to race tomorrow. And it was like, <laughs> literally like 10 seconds, I left him on the phone and I, and I hung up and I was just like, oh what my an idiot. God, <laughs> what did like, you just oh. do, you know? So it's like a pretty funny story. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens to me when I call you. I'm always like, 
Okay, I want to talk to you a lot longer, but I got to make sure you'll talk uh, to me the next 20 time. 20 minutes is all the time I got, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too much for and I can't If it's only my... 20 minutes, yeah. you haven't even said anything yeah, I yet. I haven't even gotten to the That's question just I was the intro. Ask yet. <laughs> But no, that I remember distinctly that Homestead win because your dad was there. And I yep. remember he was up in the media center and it was such a cool moment for you and, and for anybody that was following your career. I mean, even for me personally, I just was so happy for you. Plus, it's been a while since I won a race. I have yep. I didn't win since uh, 07, 08. I broke my back and pel uh, pelvis. And then, uh, you know, I went to that, had to do the World Superbike thing in 2010, which wasn't a success. Pettuccini, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and then, you know, 11 and 12, and then finally to, to you know, break through and, and get a win after such a long gap in Superbike. And it was like another thing, you know, like my brothers have won Superbike races and I hadn't. And it was like, okay, now I've, you know, kind of joined in their club that they're in. Yeah. Well, obviously the name Hayden you mentioned gave you some inroads into it but but you know clearly you're a talent and developed that talent one of the things I've never understood about families and you know I'm a father my uh, son I went through a time where I wanted to you know got him involved in motorcycling but he was never all that interested in it I, I've never understood how like your dad raced your mom raced um, your sisters race all you did do you have you always had fun with it is it like, this is all I'm going to, this is what I need to do because the family wants me to do it? Or do you actually enjoy it and did enjoy it? No, I actually enjoyed it. Some of my favorite experiences growing up and memories with my brothers is, you know, like tinkering in the garage with race bikes and, you know, going camping when we were, when we were club racing and, you know, the whole family went and I was just actually telling somebody the other day, you know, my, my sisters are probably the ones who sacrificed the most for for me and my brothers because, yeah. you know, there was a lot of times where, you know, one brother had to go somewhere, another one somewhere else, you know, and they would have to go stay somewhere. Or So they, our sisters were like our biggest fans and always have been. So, uh, but to get back to your point, it wasn't like I ever felt like I had to. It was always something that I wanted to do. And then, you know, then I just did it <clears throat> so long. I just didn't know any better. Yeah. It's just what you did, yeah. just muscle memory after a while. Roger, you know, we talked about the family thing, but I also want to know, you're you're a, a pretty incredible fan of all sports. I mean, certainly football. We know you're a huge Bears fan. Duh. But, <laughs> but, but also a Kentucky basketball. Um, I know you like basketball. You, you, I don't know if you're still playing pickup games like you used to with Jake and all that, but um, can you equate motorcycle road racing and the training that you have to do with stick and ball sports? And make the comparison well i think there's different different training for every sport that you do but the elite guys in racing you know have the same work ethic the same grind the same mentality as this you know the same as the guys in the motorcycle world at the top of their their game you know you can't i don't think you can say like transition the uh you know the training because it's always just it's different for each sport but you know, the guy who puts in the most work usually, you know, stays around the longest, uh, you know, has the better career. And I think all that's uh, pretty close. And uh, the guys who don't kind of, you know, fade out just mm -hmm. like in the real sports. So, uh, like I said, I think it's just like the guys with the mentality, like the the killer instincts. I mean, it's the same with racing and it's, uh, you know, the same with like, you know, real sports. There's some people who are gamers, you yeah. know, like – you know, Tom Brady, he just knows, loves pressure. And uh, I think that's relatable. I mean, look at a guy like Valentino Rossi, you know. He was so far back the week before at Jerez, and then he, you know, puts it on the podium the, you know, the next week. So uh, it's pretty impressive. And I am a huge sports fan. I love the Chicago Bears, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> It'll this, be okay. this, this is our year. You know, again, I get so, it. Uh, <laughs> of course, but I love, I love fantasy football too. Yeah, I mean, I just, I don't know, and those websites with those other games and just making the lineups and I don't know, I just, I just like sports. Well, one of the things related to the sport that I want to understand is, so we all know with football, we'll talk about football. You, we see this with our teams. The coaches, if that player doesn't practice during the week leading up to the game, they they won't play or they can't play. 
And you always hear the coach going, well, I got I to see him practice. You guys as racers, I know you train on bike, on cycles, you do turn track stuff, but you don't get on your race bike every day, let alone every week. You only see it from one round to another. I never understand how you cannot race and for so long, a month, get back on the bike and it's like you've been on it the whole time. It's been never any issue. You actually hear so much about that in motocross where like somebody will do an interview after the race on Saturday night and they'll be like, well, I didn't get to ride all week. Yeah, yeah exactly. I had, a cold or something. Yeah, I had a cold and I didn't ride all week. And it was like, dude, you just raced six days ago. You know what I mean? <laughs> did, you, did you forget in six days? But I think for us is everybody's in the same boat. Okay, yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think that's one reason why it's, you know, the way it is. I just think it's you just get used to it, and uh, everybody does does the same. And I think the, there's a lot of guys who do a lot of riding off-season, like the guys that live in Southern California and all that. And I actually think they start the season stronger, you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes it takes a while to, to get in the groove if, if your team doesn't do no testing and you – you know, if you ride for a team and y'all don't test and then you start racing, those guys who have all the practice, uh, you know, I just think they start the season. So especially if you're a young guy, the more seat time you can get is uh, is better. But I, you're right. I, and I get that question a lot, and it is weird. I mean, if you think about how many times we're actually on our race bike throughout the whole year, it's, it's not very much. Right. Yeah. It's probably be interesting to look to see, like, when there's back-to-back -back races like these two, you know, here and then Pittsburgh, how how that affects, like, yeah. the, you know, like the first session, if you compared the first session at Pittsburgh next week compared to Pittsburgh last week when there wasn't a race before it, it'd be kind of interesting to see if they get up to speed a little quicker. And I yeah. think some riders handle it different. Like, you'll see some guys who get, I was kind of like this in the beginning for a while, I was kind of like a slow starter. Then, you know, the last half of the season, I'd be really strong. And you see that with the other guys, and I think that's just – after they get in the rhythm and, you know, get to riding consistently, you know, they find whatever it is that, that makes them go fast. But it is it is weird. I, I've always wondered about that because guys who race motocross, I mean, they're on the bike three or four days a week. Yeah, it's a great point. They go to their practice track in the middle of the week leading up, and I'm like, you guys haven't been on it forever. Yeah. So um, I, I have another question different than that one, but it's leading into this weekend just to kind of set the, the fans up a little bit. So related to your commentary, what are you looking for coming into this weekend regarding pick any class, any couple of riders? You know, what are some what are some lead things in your mind that you want to see or wonder about this year? Well, I mean, I like to see uh, Tony, you know, if he can find his form that, uh, you know, that we haven't seen yet for whatever reason. I mean, obviously, he's a great rider. He's won a ton of races and, you know, I don't think we've ever seen him struggle, you know, this this stretch that we've seen. Right. And uh, so I'd like to see if he can bounce back. He's uh, he's pretty good at this track. He's won some races here. So, uh, and then also um, in the super sport class, uh, Sean Dillon Kelly, I think, I personally thought he was just going to yeah, walk so away with the, so, with the yeah, championship. We did too. And uh, Richie Escalante is... <laughs> I think he surprised everybody. He's got to be the, you know, the the biggest surprise of the year almost, besides mm. maybe Dominic uh, Doyle. Right. So uh, those two are who I like to see get their season started and, you know, at least battle for the win. Not, you know, they don't have to win, but at least really close that gap. Mm. Like, I don't think, I can't remember Tony not being on a podium in four races. Yeah, it's strange. I mean, it just doesn't, you know. Yeah. Like, it was always odd if he got third. Because you use it, you know, you're so yeah. used to him second or first. Yeah. Now it, that brings up like Cameron Bobier. He's obviously, I, he obviously likes the new bike. He fits right in with the new team. I don't think the change in team was as big for him as it has been for Tony. Um, but once he, once you get to the level where he's at, where he's kind of got another step on everybody and confidence in the way he feels, that's a pretty good combination right now, don't you think? Especially with Cameron, just because he is so good, and I mean he's. He's the most talented, this you know, naturally talented guy that you know I've ever rode with. And Tony said the same thing to me a couple of years ago. And Tony's yeah. raced against some pretty stellar yeah. guys. Yeah, and he's just, you know, like you ask everybody who's got the best style, and you know, everybody says, "Oh, Cameron's awesome to watch," and, it, and it's true because he doesn't, he doesn't always look that fast. And then you look at the lap times, and it's like, whoa, you know, he's. 
He's all right. But, you know, we talked about that a minute ago about how guys who don't ride that much during the, the off season. Well, Cameron said this year that this was the most he's ever rode in the off season. Well, Tony and those guys, I think they rode once. Yeah. Maybe twice. Right. I was it? Tw- I don't even know if it was twice. So Cameron kind of started the season ready to go, and it seems like maybe Tony was on the, you know, started on the back foot a little bit. And the superweight class is so competitive. You can't, you can't do that. And so. Uh, and they've I, been the opposite of that because Tony usually does start really fast yeah. and Cam doesn't, and now it's flip flop. Yeah. But yeah, Cameron, he's on another level right now. And, uh, you know, actually Bobby was really fast that superbike race he won. You know, he, Cameron wasn't just that far. I mean, he was pulling away and had it in control, but it wasn't, it was only two seconds. You know, the previous days was like four or five already. So hopefully one of those guys can step up. But right now Cameron just looks, uh, he almost looks unbeatable. I mean, I know everybody's beatable and can have a bad day, but he's just, he's got that confidence. He's looks like he's having fun. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't really get stressed out. He's always like pretty mellow, even when he wins or, or he does bad. And, you know, I think that's uh works in his benefit. So what is Tony thinking at this point? I mean, you were his teammate. He, you know, he's got to be, I don't know. I, I I feel bad for him because it's he's just not used to that. And plus he's, I think he, I see like a lot of, I don't want to say panic, but I mean, I think sometimes I watch what they're trying to do during a session and it's like, maybe they're just trying to do too much. You know, they're trying to find two seconds instead of half a second or something. And I mean, there's shocks laying on the ground. There's, <laughs> you know, it's big swing changes. arms. Yeah, swing arm. <laughs> I mean, when I see a swing arm and a shock, I'm like, yeah, wow. That's down <laughs> in the deep end. Yeah. But, I mean, they've been – I think they kind of – you know, I heard that they got a – I haven't, like, just asked Tony because, right. you know, I'm not going to go up and say, hey, man, you're struggling with it, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I know that they've got new swing arms and different stuff that maybe Yosh had and that they're trying to – trying to, you know, I could be wrong. But they're trying to make that work instead of, you know, maybe doing what – you know, that worked with Tony for, for so many years, mm. you know, sometimes you, you can get lost in stuff when you try to change too much besides what, you know, what, what worked previously. Yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting to, to, to see, and we're looking forward to hearing your commentary on the, the air, uh, what you do on Moto America Live Plus is fantastic. Um, thank you, Roger, for being on with us this week. Um, Paul and I, we're looking forward to this one for sure. Um, speaking of Live Plus, we want to make sure that you, the fans know, uh, please subscribe to Moto America Live Plus and go to our website for tickets to our rounds. we got Pittsburgh coming up next week. Uh, we are going to have fans there. Tickets are available. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you guys down the road. And Roger. I can't let him go without a cat question. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I ended it before. Yes. <laughs> so cat question. I know you were like the cat expert of anybody in this paddock. So the other day by my house, I saw a guy walking a cat on a leash. Now, is that accepted in the cat world? I, I'm not the cat expert. It's my <laughs> wife who's the... I mean, I'm just learning about cats by fault. So, you know, just, well, just being there. Yeah, I would have to ask her, but I've never, I've never seen it, but I guess supposedly if you just like like an indoor cat like if i leave a door open which i get yelled at for even two seconds right it's just gonna like bolt out and just take off and be right and just never be come- gone and you never see it again and it's just like so maybe he's just scared that the you know his little buddy's gonna <laughs> gonna, gonna take off and then be uh yeah, we have a lot of coyotes. That's why indoor anyways, cats it's, can't it's, go outside. Of you live in Southern California, so who knows? That's just a different breed. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right. All right. Well, thanks, Rod. Thanks, Rod. Yeah, right. Thanks for having me. All right.